I'm Rick Kopp. I'm a professor here at the law school, and I want to thank you so much for attending on this uh, very special uh, Veterans Day event that we have for us today, going on today. Ken Starr, our former dean, one of the first times I ever heard him talk, he gave a talk about why he thinks we should keep the jury system. I think he spoke at actually at one of our commencement ceremonies on this. And I expected um, something a little bit more legal from him. But as I recall, the thrust of his argument was there are so few ways that we as Americans now directly serve our country that jury service is, is incredibly one of the few ways we, uh, we directly serve the country. So many of us don't serve in the military. So many of us uh, don't do other things that directly serve. That struck a chord with me. And ever since hearing him talk about that, it's highlighted for me the vast gulf between the service directly that most of us, or people like me, uh, have, have not uh, given to our country, hopefully trying to be a good citizen, but comparing that with the service of our veterans really highlights for me uh, just how much all of our veterans have done for us. When I go to sit through a, a, a day of board year or something and say, there, I've done my service, uh, and contrast that with what our veterans have done. It just really makes me appreciate our veterans uh, all the more. Our veterans at Pepperdine are an incredibly wonderful group of people. We are so blessed to have a strong core of uh, military veterans here. And I'm so happy to be involved with a school that is so pro-veteran. Pepperdine has always been pro-veteran, but uh, William, when you were a student here, I don't think it was as pronounced as it is now. I've really been impressed with uh, what we've seen happen in the last few years with more and more veterans joining us. And uh, I'm very proud of our dean for taking so many extra efforts along with some of our faculty to make our veterans feel welcome. Now, I've benefited through this by having several veterans as students, and none of them have failed to impress me. They're always among our most impressive students. They have life experiences that most of us, myself included, can't relate to but can be thankful for. And having them with us makes us a better law school. I always try to say thank you to our veterans when I find out they're a veteran. I hope we all do. Well, we're especially honored today to have William Wagasey with us as our guest speaker. He's one of the most memorable students I've ever had at Pepperdine. I've been there about 25 years teaching. And I didn't meet William in a classroom. I met William because William uh, always was, in, in addition to working hard studying, working out with incredible <laughs> intensity. <laughs> and I play a silly little game called Ultimate Frisbee. We play out on the track field sometimes. And I would see William just doing the most amazing, grueling workouts along with a, a friend out there. And we'd be tossing the, the disc bath. And <laughs> I'd say, who is this guy? And I saw him at the law school. And one day, I don't know if you're trying to work on your aerobics or what, but he said he just jumped in and joined us in a game and uh, was just incredibly down to earth. I learned he had an amazing sense of humor. Every time I've seen him in any place, he's just filled up the room with his personality. And I think that you'll see that uh, today uh, also. Uh, before coming to Pepperdine, William was a linebacker at Notre Dame. Uh, the intensity of a NCAA Division I athlete at a, a prominent football program is more than reflected in what he has done since. Coming to Pepperdine, he earned two degrees, his Juris Doctor degree and his Master in Dispute Resolution. Shortly after he, uh, after 9-11, after he graduated, he decided in a really unusual uh, uh, decision to, despite having two law-related degrees, one JD and another law-related degree, to join the Navy and serve our country uh, because related to the attacks that had taken place against us. And of course, he became a Navy SEAL, went through Bud's training, served, if I remember correctly, about 10 years uh, full-time in uh, the SEALs, fought with distinction for the United States, both in Iraq and in Afghanistan. After about 10 years of service, he worked for a time directly or full-time with the Gary Sinise Foundation, 
with its efforts uh, with veterans and uh, honoring the serving veterans, he's still active with the foundation, although he's now started life in the corporate world as well. We're very blessed to have uh, William with us. We're also very blessed to have uh, his girlfriend Lexi, who's here at the front. We might want to give her a round of applause. <laughs> We also have some royalty with us, <laughs> special visitors today. We have Lady Sophia. Would you raise your hand, Lady Sophia? <laughs> and Lady Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> and I just got to say, I've never been prouder to introduce a guest speaker. Please warmly welcome William Waggis. <laughs> <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good? Yeah, Good. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Professor Cup, and thank you, Dean, for having me here. It's an honor, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. So, um, Before we get started, I'm going to play a short video for you guys for some of the work that we did at the Gary Sneeze Foundation, and then after that, I'm going to take you back in time to the late 90s when I was in law school, and then we'll go from there. This head-to-toe bandage is the only thing I could see was his eyes. But when he opened his eyes, I knew it was him. He lost his whole crew that day, and he has said that he wants to live his life in a way that would make all his friends that he lost that day proud. Sergeant First Class Michael Schlitz enlisted in the Army in 1996. And his mother, Robbie, was not surprised. Michael was an energetic young man attracted to the disciplined life of the military. After 9-11, he was impatient to go overseas to fight. And I'd have to calm him down because, Mom, they won't let me volunteer. I keep volunteering, but they won't let me go. I says, when the time's right, you'll get to go when it's your turn. Michael's turn came in August of 2006 when he was deployed with the 10th Mountain Division. He volunteered to go to war, and he knew, um, just like any warrior who goes there, that you might be killed, you might be severely injured. Mike went head on uh, to go face the enemy over there. He wanted to be part of an elite unit, the Rangers, and uh, that's what he signed up for, to go further, fight harder, move faster. Michael was involved in some of the heaviest combat of the war. He received the hard-earned trust and admiration of the men under his command, whose safety he put before his own. In February of 2007, Michael was part of a routine patrol convoy. As they drove down a dirt road, Michael's vehicle struck an IED. It was two artillery rounds attached to a propane tank buried about six feet under the ground. Not only did the shrapnel come in, but it also sprayed everything with propane. My medic who was sitting in the back seat behind the driver and my gunner, they were both killed instantly. My driver, suffered and eventually died of burns. The only reason why I'm pretty much sitting here right now is when it hit my vehicle, I was actually thrown from the vehicle. The flames that covered Michael's body had to be put out with a fire extinguisher. He lost both arms below the elbow and had been burned over 85% of his body. You know, I wasn't allowed to look in a mirror uh, for my entire 10 months stay in the hospital. I, I really think that of all of the injuries, the psychological is worse. I mean, everywhere I went, especially back then, people stared, you know, I was head to toe bandages, obviously burned no hands. I didn't have prosthetics at the time. There was not one thing on a daily basis I could do for myself. So feeding, getting a drink, uh, doing wound care, all that pretty much fell on my mother's shoulders. Michael and his mother moved to Texas where they lived in a house that was ill-suited to his injuries. I met Michael and his mother, Robbie, when they visited me on the set of CSI New York. I was immediately impressed by his good humor and his positive attitude, and we stayed in touch. A few months later, the Gary Sinise Foundation reached out with an offer to build him a custom smart home. And, and that, that took me back a little bit. He said, you know, Mom, there's so many other people out there that need it more than we do. And I said, you're right. We can live here in Texas in this house and you can have mama under your roof, right beside you for the rest of your life. <laughs> because maybe I'll call him back. <laughs> With 
support from the local community under the Gary Sinise Foundation's RISE program and in collaboration with Building for America's Bravest, construction began. On October 30th, 2014, Michael and Robbie Schlitz were given the keys to their brand new home. Uh, it, it's beyond words. It's, it's more than I ever expected. The house is set up for his limited range of motion. The house is set up for his vision. The house is set up so that he can get to things. Basically, the whole house runs off an iPad. So if I want to dim the lights in every room, I can. Or I want to put down motion sensors, I can. It's stuff I can do whether I have my prosthetics on or off. That, to me, is a lifesaver. As Gary has said, if, if we don't take care of our warriors, before, during, and after the battle, why would we expect anybody to serve? That's really our mission at the Gary Sinise Foundation, is to take care of our warriors, inspire, educate, and build the communities that they are in, and it takes everybody, and that makes our country stronger. Today, Michael is an ambassador for the Gary Sinise Foundation, regularly traveling the country for speaking engagements and spreading his message of resilience and brotherhood. For Michael and his mother, they haven't just gotten a new home, found a new beginning. To learn more about the Gary Sinise Foundation and how you can support other wounded veterans like Michael Schlitz, go to GarySiniseFoundation.org. Thank you. I'm going to bring up a couple pictures here. Um, I'll get to this picture in a second. Does anybody recognize that person that's standing next to me? Anybody seen the movie American Sniper? When he's on the gun, and he's kind of uh, talking to uh, Chris Kyle's character, and he's saying, uh, oh, who's the legend now, right? Oh, what happened? We went down. Oh, there we go. Uh, that's, his name's Jacob Schick. He was hit down in 2003 uh, by an IED. Marine, super brave. Great guy, has a personality uh, that goes on for days. Jacob told me something that you kind of heard Mike Schlitz touch on, which was, uh, Jacob said to me, I think I know something about physical pain. Physical pain will let you know that you're alive, and the emotional pain and the psychological pain that comes with your in injuries will challenge you to stay that way for the rest of your life. And uh, Jacob's doing great right now. When a lot of these guys first get injured and they come back home, Jacob didn't talk to anybody. And the first person he talked to uh, was his nurse that he opened up to. And then he later married her. Uh, <laughs> it happens quite a bit, actually. Uh, and he's doing great. Um, but uh, I talk to him every now and then. And, and uh, I said, hey, man, I use your quote. And I mean, he's always in a good mood. And he goes, yeah, he goes, he goes use it. He goes, it's because it's true. Uh, my work with the uh, Gary Sinise Foundation, uh, here's a picture of me and Gary. Um, I, I was the director of veterans outreach for a year and a half. Uh, before that, I actually took some time. I'm going to take you a little bit back, and then we're going to go forward. Uh, before that, I did 10 years as an active duty Navy SEAL. I did three combat tours in Iraq, one combat tour in Afghanistan. Before that, I was here for four years, uh, some of the most memorable four years of my life. Before that, I played football at Notre Dame. I was there for five years. I graduated with an accounting degree and a second major in philosophy in 1996. Stayed there one more year to finish out my eligibility. And after five cold winters at Notre Dame, uh, I was looking for uh, law school to go to. And then people asked me, like, well, how do you choose law school? And I said, I chose it by latitude. <laughs> so <laughs> the winters there are pretty brutal. I remember going to class at Notre Dame. and. Um, one day it was negative 60 degree with wind chill, below zero. Um, it was brutal. I, I, I bundled up and I was just going to class to see if I get, get into a class. Got to talk to the professor because it's already full. So I go over there, I walk five minutes. I was so bundled up, I was good on everything except for my thighs. My thighs went numb uh, walking to class. And I got in there and the professor's like, nope, can't take it, we're full. And I'm like, well, can I just stay back here and thaw for a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> And I remember the next day it was 10 degrees above zero, so it was a 70 degree shift in, in weather, and I went out in just a flannel and I was great. <laughs> but uh, Pepperdine was a wonderful time for me. It was it, uh, after five years at Notre Dame, at, at that time in my life, all my, all my dreams and all my focus was making it to the NFL at that time. 
And, and really, I fell short of a lot of my dreams at Notre Dame. I didn't even really ever break full into the starting lineup. I was pretty much a backup linebacker, outside linebacker my whole time there. I started on some of our defensive packages and played on a lot of special teams. Uh, and after five years there, I was really emotionally, physically, and mentally worn out. So when I came to Pepperdine, and football took up so much of my time at Notre Dame, so when I came to Pepperdine, and, and then I, um, at, like for example at Notre Dame, I'd go to classes or, for you know, two to three or four hours a day, and then I had to, uh, I, I had to go to practice, be there by 2.30, I didn't get out until 8.30, and then we usually had to go over to, uh, we, had a, we had study hall for a couple hours, and uh, we had some tutors that were great. If it wasn't for those tutors, I don't know if I'd ever graduated because I was just so physically exhausted that they'd help you walk you through your assignments. And, uh, and, and that's, that's a lot of how I, I learned out over there, just uh, having mentors and, and mentorship. After, uh, but when I came out here to Pepperdine, it was, it was wonderful. Sun always shining. You know, you, you come out here, it's like going to a country club, right? You know, <laughs> not that I belong to one, but I can only imagine, right? So uh, it, was, it was just such a, a resetting for my soul and for my heart and then coming to school and all the great people. Here there's a saying that says all schools are brick and mortar, but it's the people that make the difference. And I really find that at my two alma maters at Notre Dame and at Pepperdine is, is the people here and the people at Notre Dame that have really uh, made the difference and continue to make the difference in, in, uh, in my life and other people's lives. I was always interested in the Navy. I would talk to the people that were in ROTC at Notre Dame and, and talk to them like, oh, what are the SEALs like? I was kind of always interested in it. But after Notre Dame, I was just, I was too worn out. Um, I, I needed a reset and I, I wouldn't have any motivation to join uh, the Navy at that time. But I, I was always interested. It was something that was always, um, it, it was always kind of on my heart to do, but just life circumstances and, and where I was at that time, it, it wasn't the right step for me. I came to Pepperdine, and, and during three years here, I, j I really got reset, um, just mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, everything. And my last year, I graduated in 2000 with my Juris Doctorate. I was finished up my master's degree in dispute resolution, and I, I thought to myself, I, I still want to join the military, but I don't know if it's the right thing. And you know, like we, in, our, in every one of our life's journeys, we always think like, we always have these really big dreams, and a lot of times they're really far off, and they stay that way, they stay far off, unless we start taking action or small steps to at least gather intelligence to understand if they're even doable. Um, and at that point, I didn't even know if it was doable. So I thought to myself, okay, well maybe I'll join the reserves, and, uh, and, and, and I'll think about it, I don't know if it's possible. So I joined the reserves in March of 2001. At this time, my parents didn't even know I joined the reserves. Uh, they, th they would call me and go, well, what, uh, what, what firms are you interviewing with? And I'd be like, uh, you know, uh, Smith, Jones, and Barney. I don't know. I just made up names, you know. <laughs> and they're like, all right, is that a good firm? I'm like, yeah, you know, they're, they're, uh, you know, it's, you know, the, they're out there somewhere. I'm sure there's a, uh, but I, I didn't tell them for a while. And then, and then I remember, it, it was I was talking to my recruiter about even the process to become a Navy SEAL and. And he says, it's going to be tough, you know, you're, I was right on the age cuff. I was 28 years old, and he said, we got to get your package in now. And the whole story of even getting my package approved to go to Bud's is a whole other set, uh, set of videos and DVDs of all the uh, hoops we had to jump through. But, and, and I didn't even know if I was going to do it for sure, you know. I thought, okay, well, you know, I will start interviewing. I'll start doing some things. I was trying to look in the business world, and then 9-11 happened. And uh, I have a really good friend who lives on the East Coast. I actually just talked to him today. Uh, his name's uh, John Lynch, and he had a brother, Richard Lynch, who was in the South Tower, uh, and he didn't make it out. Some of the people on his floor actually did make it out. But he lost his brother that day. I remember him calling me on the phone, and uh, I didn't have a TV at that time because I was, like, living on, you know, living on fumes. Uh, and my phone was ringing off the hook, and he called me. So I went over to a friend's house, and I saw what was happening. And then that's when I knew, like, okay, uh, not, that's when a dream over here and all my fears of trying to go for it and take all those little steps turned to something like, okay, now my motivation is way higher than my fear was. And that's when I started taking every single step I knew how to make it. And uh, I said, whatever happens, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that I go. So they actually had to send my package all the way up to the commanding officer at, at the BUDS compound. BUDS is basic underwater demolition SEAL training. And they said, hey, this guy wants to come here. He's 28 years old. He has three degrees. He enlisted in the Navy as an E3, 
which is very, very low rank for anybody that doesn't know. Uh, so he might not be too smart. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, for, for most people, like uh, uh, those people who graduate, those people who graduate from college usually, you know, they have a degree and you can come as an officer. And an officer would be an O1, would be like a second lieutenant um, or an ensign in the Navy. And then an O3, you know, all the way up to admiral and general. Well, E3 is like in the Navy, it's just a seaman. And uh, I came in the Navy as an E3 and, and people were like, why'd you come in enlisted? I said, well, they told me they'd give me one rank for every degree I had. So they're like, uh. <laughs> So in my buds class, after I got, uh, after the, the CEO, the commanding officer, Captain Smithers, he looked at my pack and he said, well, why wouldn't I take him? He doesn't need any waivers. I know he's right on the cuff. And why, why wouldn't I take him? And I, I remember talking to a, a captain in the Navy is the same rank as a colonel in the Army. So it's way high up there. And I remember talking to another captain who was on the East Coast. And he, he told me if, if I wanted to go an officer, all the, the hoops I would jump through because there's only a few officers that get the chance. Most of them are from the Naval Academy, then from ROTC. And he told me, he's like, the Navy tests your running ability at the mile and a half. And he said, he goes, well, listen, if you want to do this, he goes, you need to have your mile and a half under uh, nine minutes. I'm like, well, you can pull me with a truck. I'm not running under nine minutes, you know. Uh, so I went enlisted. Uh, I dropped everything. I pushed for it. Uh, I, I got ex uh, accepted in the program. Captain Smithers let me in. And then he told everybody before I even got there that I was coming. He's like, I got this Notre Dame football player, lawyer guy that was c that's coming. So everywhere I checked in, they were like, are you the lawyer? And I'm like, well, I haven't passed the bar. And I graduated school. And they're like, what are you doing here? And I don't, I'm like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> getting ready to get crushed, I guess. Uh, so <laughs> during that time, uh, uh, I started going through buds. I was the oldest guy in my buds class, and I was the heaviest guy in my buds class. And two things that did not help me whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, Marcus Luttrell, I think he came and spoke here not too long ago, right, in September. Uh, we were texting back and forth. Uh, he actually texted me not too long ago, and he's like, uh, he probably won't like me to say this, but he's like, he goes, do you think I'm smart enough to graduate from Pepperdine with a history degree? You know, and, <laughs> and uh, I didn't take a, I, I was doing a couple of things, so I didn't text him back right away. And he says, I see from your slow response that the answer is no. You know? <laughs> I'm like, no, brother, you got this. Um, so uh, <laughs> Marcus, Marcus me did a deployment on my second tour uh, to Ramadi. I'll get to that in a little bit. But so we were going through buds. I was the oldest and heaviest guy in my buds class. Most, most SEALs, you know, they come through buds when they're like 18 to 25 years old. And, uh, and I, I was 29 when I went to buds, actually 30 when I graduated SEAL qualification training. And it, it was rough. It was rough for me. People that are my size, we, we don't do that well. Um, and the reason is just because of the body weight. We do all our runs in the soft sand. In the six months that I was at uh, basic and demolition SEAL training, we ran 806 miles in the soft sand, and that's not including Hell Week. And these aren't just like nice little jogs, you know. Uh, when we'd have an instructor lead us through the sand, that instructor uh, would get in formation, and he would take off at like a six-minute mile pace. And you didn't know if you were running three miles. The shortest run you knew was going to be three miles. The longest one usually in the soft sand is 10 miles. And... Uh, and in my buds class, we started with like, I believe a, a little over 200 people in my indoc, and then first phase, I think we classed up with 186, if my memory serves me correctly. And we take off on those runs, I couldn't feel my thighs in the first three minutes. And uh, after that, it was uh, just uh, all heart. I, I swear sometimes in the middle of a run, I would, I would die and go to heaven, and God would say, your work's not done, get back. And then I'd be like, please, please let me, my work is finished. Uh, I remember one run in Indoc, I got that, you know that feeling you get when you get a second wind? Like, I got that feeling six different times. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I'm not, I, like, I remember the second time I got, I'm like, oh my God, I've never had this, like, twice, you know? And then my body just kept on releasing nitric oxide. I was like, oh, man, it, it was rough. And I would always constantly fall back behind the runs. And, uh, and then, in, you know, on, on Monday mornings, we'd have these huge PTs. We'd do hundreds of push-ups and you do pull-ups and the pull-ups aren't where you just get up there and you rack them out the, bar the bars are really big and so you get up there and you go by the instructor and the instructor leads you so he's up there and he's like well, he goes up there and he goes up <laughs> down one and then the class repeats up 
two, and, bef <laughs> and before he gets up, he's like, we're gonna do a set of 15, right? So then the instructors trade out while you're getting crushed, and I mean, eventually you're just falling off the bar, you know? Uh, and then we do the same thing on the dip bar, and we'd go like, up, you know, hold it for the raw file, like down, and then hold that for a while, which was even worse. And so we do that, like on money, we do like 300 dips, like thousands of push-ups, and uh, hunt thousands of leg levers, all this stuff, and then all these runs, and log PT, and then guess what? We'd come back on Tuesday, and we'd do the exact same thing, you know? And I'd be like, aren't you supposed to have recovery day? Like, <laughs> and, uh, and, like, and, and I just, the guys who, the guys who really do well at basic underwater demolition seal training are usually, like, 5'5", five, five, 130 pounds, like, ex-wrestlers that wrestled at, like, 105, uh, who are just, like, muscle and sinew, uh, and, uh, and people like me who have plenty of adipose tissue, like, uh, uh, we don't do as well, and I would just, it, but after a while, the instructors realize, you know, no matter what they do to you, you're pretty much not going to quit, especially after Hell Week. So I remember when we went through Hell Week, they start off, uh, it's called Breakout, you're in the tents, you've probably seen a little bit of it on TV on some of the Discovery Channel episodes or whatever. They, they shoot a bunch of the rounds in the air, and you're running around, and you grab your boat. And, uh, and by this time, it's usually the fourth or fifth week into first phase. And my class started with 186 people, and we went into Hell Week with 68. So that shows you how many people that we lost that ring the bell. And, and, uh, and uh, it, so you run around, you low crawl, you get wet and sandy. And wherever you get wet and sandy, uh, and where you ever have a crease in your skin, that skin gets rubbed off. So you have all these weeping sores, like anywhere that you have a crease. That, so under your arms, all the way around your belt buck, all the way around your waistline, uh, behind your knees. And after a hell week, uh, I had no hair on the top of my head. I had a reverse mohawk filled with scabs that looked like a turtle shell. It's like one scab going into the other because you're running with the boat on your head. And the boat just kind of bounces and goes back and forth. And, and when we put that boat on our head in the first night of hell week on Sunday, we ran nine miles down to Imperial Beach. Uh, with that boat on our head. And it wasn't like a nice jog. You had one instructor with each boat crew mushing you. And uh, they were like, take the lead, take the lead. And then you go take the lead. And uh, you have your boat crew leader. And my guy was, his name was uh, uh, Derek. And I remember he was way, way, way too motivated, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have all these conversations with him because I'd be like, Derek. He's like, what, Wags? Everyone calls me Wags on the teams. I go, what do they call the person that graduates last in medical school? He's like, I don't know, I'm not. I go, doctor, that's what they call him, doctor. I go, let's just survive this thing. <laughs> but no, he had to win every, every race, so. Uh, and, we, and we were boat crew one, because you get put in a boat crew by your height, so we were all the tallest and biggest guys. And so, uh, uh, so that everybody can share the weight on your boat. At the end of Hell Week, um, I got one hour of sleep uh, in Hell Week. I know on the videos they tell you that you get like more, maybe like up to four hours, but they give you other chances to sleep. But what they do is like they'll make you build a sand fort, right? And with your boats in the sand. And that fort should like comfortably fit about five people. And then they make 50 people get in there. So you're stacked up on top of each other. And, uh, and I remember I couldn't feel my legs because I like, had five people on top of me. And I was in so much pain, I just couldn't get wait, wait to get out of the fort. I was like, can we stop the sleep operation and go, <laughs> go to the next thing? Uh, the only thing I was really good at in Buds was taking the cold water. Because uh, all the guys who had like 4% body fat, man, they were just jackhammering, you know. And I wouldn't even be shivering yet. I'm like, I can do this all day. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, um, but uh, most of the guys that you talk to who went through Buds and Seals training will probably tell you that the cold water was the hardest thing. For me, it was uh, basically everything else. So. <laughs> But it was rough. But at the end of Hell Week, you couldn't even, I couldn't even tell where my knees began and ended because I just looked like I had one big thigh muscle all the way down to my boot. And my, my feet were so swollen, I kept on thinking like, that the salt water in the sun was shrinking my boots, but it was actually my feet were swelling up. And uh, I, I remember after every medical check we'd get, we usually get, after Tuesday, one medical check a day, uh, I would, uh, it was so hard to get my foot back in there. And you don't even, after a while, you, you uh, you're just, you know, there's, there's a saying in Buds that goes like, uh, mind in neutral and gluteus maximus in gear. We use other words, but you kind of get the idea. But like, uh, and you're, just kind of, you're just kind of going, the instructors realize you're not going to quit yet. And then, 
uh, usually after a certain time, and we graduated Hell Week with uh, 30 individuals. And the whole SEAL pipeline, you got to go basic in order to demolition SEAL training. It's got three phases. We do first phase, second phase, third phase, and then uh, um, and then we and then we go from there. Uh, so it, it was it was pretty rough, and I'm going to have to jump through some things because uh, of time. But uh, um, we got through there. I remember we went on our first tour. I went to three tours. My first three tours were to Iraq. My first tour, uh, we were in Baghdad and Mosul. Uh, my second tour was in Ramadi, when Ramadi was the most violent city in the world back in 06. It accounted fa for half of all SIG acts. A SIG act is any significant act by the enemy. And uh, there was anywhere from uh, 30 to 50 SIG acts in Ramadi on a given day. And if you go look at that city on Google Earth, it's only like 3.5 miles from end to end. And uh, that, was a, that was a pretty rough deploy deployment. Um, some of that, uh, we relieved Chris Kyle's platoon when we fought through there. Um, and some of that shows in there. They lost Mark Lee and, and uh, Ryan Job actually got hit in the face, but he actually died uh, a few years later uh, in the hospital. But um, uh, on a on, uh, thing when he's trying to get some reconstructive surgery done on his face. Uh, and they also lost Michael Mansour, who jumped on a grenade on a roof and gave his life uh, for his two fellow companions. So, and, that, and he was a new guy in the platoon. And then my third tour was in Rawa, Iraq. Uh, things had kind of settled down in Iraq by that time. It was 08, 09, and, and uh, we weren't getting in a whole bunch of firefights then. And, of course, that's when uh, I decided to get hurt. I got uh, skipped across the desert at 72 kilometers per hour on a vehicle rollover. So that's the thing about SEAL training. SEALs die every year in, in training from jumping in accidents, uh, jumping out of airplanes to uh, all sorts of things. Just the nature of the beast of, of, uh, of the work that we do is, is highly dangerous. Um, you, you, just, you never know who's going to show up. I remember uh, one time we were doing this training op out at San Clemente Island. We were uh, doing more ops and we were coming over. Uh, the, the boats had dropped us off and we're kicking in with the rucks and we're kind of floating around. We we're about to uh, break off into two groups, and uh, the, the guys who were in charge of the two groups, the two leaders, were trying to get a head count, and they were like, someone's in the wrong group, someone's in the wrong group, and it was a new moon out, so you couldn't see really well, and we were like, all right, well, who's in the wrong group, and, and then they started, all right, give me your names instead of a head count, so they got everybody names, and they go, and you know, you're kind of floating here, and the next guy might be like floating right here, and the next guy might be floating right there, and, and he's like, okay, well, if I got all my guys, and, I, and you got all your guys, then who the heck is this? And then he like kicks over there, and it was a big sea lion just floating in the water. <laughs> so that, so we was like, all right, kick it out, we're good. <laughs> but uh, <when, laughs> I got some sea stories for days. But uh, but what I what I took um, from law school. Uh, and so we can get some questions and stuff like that. And, and I'll take you through some, uh, maybe a few of the other pictures. I guess that's me and Gary have had us up there for a long time, huh? Uh, Gary's a great guy. What I, what I took from law school when I, when I was here, uh, a couple things that really, really helped me overseas. While you guys are here, you know, you're studying, you're, you know, studying torts. Do you still teach torts? <laughs> awesome. Uh, and then, uh, you know, constitutional law. Constitutional law was one of my favorite classes taught by uh, Professor Kamek. Uh, by the grade he gave me, I guess he didn't think it was one of my favorite classes. But <laughs> <laughs> I remember I emailed him one time on a question uh, that I had in class, and, and he emailed me back, but I didn't get to see, I didn't see his response because I didn't check my email. And it was like, he was like, be prepared for class tomorrow. And then the next day, like, uh, he called on me, and I wasn't ready. And I was like, hmm, I should have checked that email. <laughs> But uh, what I took from law school was a couple things that really, really helped me. Number one, organizing vast amounts of information, right? Everybody studies here by outlines. Uh, when I was in the Navy, I learned five different languages. I learned Pashtun, I learned Arabic, I learned Dari, I learned Tagalog, and let me see if I can remember the fifth one I learned. But uh, uh, Tagalog, Arabic, oh, and Farsi. Farsi and Persian are kind of like, uh, Persian and Dari are kind of the same language, but I took two different courses for them. Um, and I, I, for, I learned them all and then forgot them all. But when I was learning them, what law school taught me was uh, just how to organize vast amounts of information. Uh, even when I started learning those languages, I would study like, I would find 200 nouns, 50 verbs, uh, 20 adjectives, I, the direct objects, the pronouns, the sentence structure, and then I would go. 
Uh, and uh, if you know, if you can memorize all those things in the first two weeks and then start practicing, you'd be surprised how far you can go. And when I would get overseas and, and talk with all the, uh, all the different people, I'll bring up uh, one of my favorite uh, posh, uh, posh tune guys over here. Um, let's see, where is he? Uh, anybody know who that is? Yeah, Mohammed Gulab. So that's the guy who saved Marcus in the movie Lone Survivor. So uh, and uh, defended him. And really, it's interesting because his we were at Marcus's ranch. That's when they were doing the 60-minute bit on Marcus. Did anybody see that? Um, yeah. So uh, they did a 60-minute special on on Marcus that time. That's me hanging out hanging out with AC. We're just chilling. <laughs> That's JJ. JJ was actually in the movie Lone Survivor in a small bit. You probably didn't uh, remember him. Uh, they didn't ask me to be in any roles in that because they didn't want me to kind of overshadow the actor. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but in the other things that um, law school gave me, oh, and here I got to put this one up real quick. These are two SEALs in training. <laughs> that's, that's on the Navy SEAL Oak obstacle course. Um, and that's me and Marcus. Uh, but law school helped me organize vast amounts of information. All the things that you need to learn from mission planning to mission execution over there, you're, as soon as you hit boots on the ground, you are on a treadmill to learn as much as you can. You usually have about two weeks to turn over with the previous, uh, previous uh, SEAL team. But you're, you're reading all the after action reports before you go over as you're getting prepped to go over there, so you're get, gaining knowledge, but it's another thing to be over there and, and uh, get boots on the ground and, and go out. And, uh, and you know, you, you're, you never feel like you're completely prepared and completely ready to go. You know, like I always felt like a new guy in the SEAL teams from my first deployment all the way to my fourth deployment. Uh, because the first, my first two deployments were in urban warfare, uh, just fighting in close quarter combat. Uh, all the time. I mean, our longest shot. I mean, I had some long shots in Iraq. So I was a, I was a lead sniper, but th that was an anomaly. Most of them they were 200 yards and in, which is which isn't that far. Uh, and um, my third deployment was in the desert. And my fourth deployment was in the mountains. And one of the things I can always say about going forward in life is is never get comfortable and never get complacent. Complacency kills. Uh, I remember on my fourth deployment, I got a little arrogant and I thought like I didn't need to train like I. Nietzsche, I was like, oh, this is my last deployment. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to be good. This isn't my first rodeo. And man, I got a rude awakening when I m marched up and down through the mountains in Afghanistan. It wasn't like I was working out. I was working out. I was just not doing the workouts I should have been doing. I was like running on the treadmill. Running on the treadmill is not the same thing as rucking up and down mountains with weight. And uh, I was hurting, to put it, uh, to put it, to put it slightly. Uh, a couple of the other things that I took from law school is just rules of engagement and dealing with them and what a reasonable certainty is, right? I mean, you guys probably hear ad nauseum about the reasonable person and what a reasonable certainty is, right? For through three, four years of law school or if you're on the six-year program, you know. Uh, and I, and when, when we go out to war, we'd have the JAG come and give us maybe a 20-minute brief. And uh, they would just say, hey, if you're in reasonable certainty for your life, you can you know, engage the enemy. Well, when we go train, for the most part, we uh, have an absolute certainty. That's what they usually train you to, is an absolute certainty when you're going through the kill house. Because when you're going through the, like, the kill house, for example, they'll, they'll put up paper targets, and a kill house is a ballistic house that you can go in and they can change the rooms around. And if you shoot at a target with live ammo, it won't go through the wall. So it's like a safe house. And they're built by engineers, so the bullets won't ricochet either. The, the walls will absorb them, but it won't go through the wall. Like my first experience in the kill house was, we do everything crawl, walk, run, right? But when I uh, came through the kill house for the first time, uh, I came through there and you know, I was used to my linebacker days and we were going through there and the instructors, they, sit up, they stand up on the rafters and watch and they got whistles blowing, they got some instructors down here and they watch you as you go in. Well, you don't know what's on the other side of that wall, just like when you go into a bad guy's or a high value targets or a bad guy's house. Well, we're over here and they put four targets in the room and, uh, on, and if they have a gun or a knife, uh, if that paper target has a gun or a knife, then you can engage them and you can shoot them, right? And, uh, but if they, if they have a purse or a phone, you can't. 
Unless they're on the phone too long, then you can shoot them. No. Uh, but, but you're not supposed to. They're considered an unknown, and you might just you might take out whoever you need to take out in the room and just hold on that person. Well, my first time going through the kill house, I was all geared up and ready to go, and my officer in charge, my OIC, uh, takes this uh, device out. It's called a flashbang, and, uh, and he's going to throw it in there. Now, if you get one safety violation during any of your training, because training never ends, and the pressure never ends that's on you. So if you get one safety violation, you get a warning to, and you get sat down and talked to. If you get two safety violations, you usually go in front of a board. And that can be a Trident review board where they review whether they're going to take your Trident, the thing that may, uh, signifies that you're a Navy SEAL. And uh, so running in on a flashbang would be a safety violation. Shooting an unknown is definitely a safety violation. Uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So we were coming in there, and the instructors, because it was our first run of the day, they had put four unknowns in there. So they had put four people with all either purses or telephones or whatever. And my, my OC shows me the flashbang. That's his nonverbal cue that he's about to flow, throw the flashbang in the door. Then I'm over here with my gun, and I'm going to wait for him, wait for the flashbang to go off. And then I'm gonna, supposed to go in there and sweep the targets, hold on the unknowns, and take out any of the bad guys. So he shows uh, me the flashbang. I nod my head. He takes the door and cracks it. Well, me, you know, five years of training at Notre Dame, when he cracked that door, that was just like them hiking the football, right? <laughs> so I was in blitz mode. I came through that door, and I shot everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you know that scenario, like, where, uh, you know, like in life, where you just, you just hope... Uh, you just hope somebody comes and like yells at you because you did something that was bad, you know? Just like, give me my verbal beating and then let me go on. Uh, I came out and no one would even give me eye contact. Uh, <laughs> not any of my teammates, not any of the instructors. They just blew the whistle. And I, I remember being in there in the room and like as this kind of smoke was clearing, I'm like, I, there should have been three other people in there with me. It should have been a four-man entry. I remember sitting there like, I'm in here by myself. And I remember thinking like, I don't think I remember hearing the flashbang go off. I'm like, I'm probably in trouble. <laughs> so I, uh, I remember I came out, and the first thing my leading petty officer did was uh, take my weapon from me. <laughs> and then the next thing they did was, uh, uh, they, I remember thinking to myself, because that would have been five safety violations. I remember asking, like, where would you guys throw the safety violation? We th were like, we threw it over there. And then uh, in this area, we were not... And then, uh, and then I thought to myself, um, am I going to get a safety violation? And then they were like, we're going to talk about it. And they said, uh, am I still going to be a SEAL? And they're like, we'll talk about that too. You know? <laughs> I was like, this is not a good day. And I just remember, this is another kind of lesson for life, is no one could ever say anything to me that would make me feel worse about something that I did. In the SEAL teams, your reputation is everything. Right? We don't get paid more if we capture more bad guys or if we take out more bad guys or anything. Your reputation in the SEALs is everything. Rank is secondary. Yeah, there's a rank and it means something in the, in the military, of course, but your rank is secondary. I never called any of my officers sir. Uh, I always called them by their name or their nickname unless I was briefing uh, usually another uh, inner service like Army or Marines in front of them. Then, you know, we'd play the game. But in, in my small unit, we were always just, I was WAGs, you know, uh, usually call each other by their last names. And everything is based on your reputation. And because uh, if you do something that takes away from your reputation, no one's ever going to say anything to me that's going to make me feel worse. I would eat out my own guts uh, just in just like uh, nervous energy about it. And I remember they had a tire that you had to pull if you kind of made a mistake. And I remember I would have pulled that tire for five weeks if they'd asked me to, uh, just as long as I could still stay a SEAL. And uh, through that whole deal, because this wasn't our first evolution, uh, we had been through some other trainings before. Um, and my chief at the time and my leading petty officer, they went to bat for me. And I didn't get one safety violation after that. And the rest of the time there, I had to, I had to get myself out of blitz linebacker mode. And I had to go through the kill house not any faster than I could think. Um, I had to really slow myself down. And that took a lot of uh, inner dialogue talk with myself uh, to, go through, to go through it. Um, and that's one thing that I always took, uh, even from my master's class here at Dispute Resolution, uh, in you know, some of the books, Getting to Yes, being hard on the problem and being soft on the people. And that's something that I always talk about when I go and talk to, whether I'm talking to a Fortune 500 company or, or uh, another corporation or, or a team, is about being hard on the problem and soft on the people. And you'd be surprised how many people are in the workforce that have worked for years and have never heard that. 
you know. Um, and the only time that I'll be hard on the person is if they're not hard on themselves. And in the whole time I was in the SEAL teams, we only had to get rid of one guy who wasn't hard on himself. Uh, but if you're hard on yourself, then it's our job to help you work through it and get better at what you're doing. Um, one of the last things that I'll probably uh, leave you with uh, before I open it up for questions, because I know we're kind of running down on time, is uh, one of the things that's always helped me is the people that do the best in life um, are the people that have high anxiety and high confidence. And always remember that. You can never lose your sense of urgency. People that have high anxiety and low confidence are always overwhelmed. People that have high confidence and low anxiety are overconfident, and they don't have the sense of urgency to get them going. In the military, I always had high anxiety, and sometimes I started off with low confidence, and I had to develop my confidence as I went. And the way I did that with everything, and the way I continue to do that, because right now I'm starting a career at 42 years old, and that can be daunting, is I find mentors. I find mentorship, and all the guys that we saw here, that you saw here today, uh, or you know, some of these guys that have been wounded, they'll say to me, Wags, you know, I never had a plan B outside the military. Uh, I wanted to be a soldier for 20 years. Marcus tells, tells me that sometimes. Like, he'll still tell his wife, Melanie, if we ever go to war with another uniform service, he goes, I'm jo joining back in. I'm like, Marcus, you can't. You had like nine fractured vertebrae. You're like, oh, stuff. But, uh, but his heart is still in it. And uh, it's those people that you can never lose your sense of urgency. You can't be a race car in the red all the time. You've got to be able to have fun. Uh, there were times all the time that even when we were suffering together as a crew that we found times to have fun. Sometimes we'd be in the surf uh, getting tortured and uh, I mean, you know, we call it surf torture because it's just really cold water, but I loved it. You know, I was like, ah, oh, you know, this is great for my joints. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and the instructors would say, if we can just get one quitter, we'll quit this evolution. Well, that was never true. If they got 20 quitters, they just continue. It was on a time, you know. And I would remember I would just say like, hey, if someone gets this one, I'll get the next one, you know, and guys would laugh, but it kind of breaks up the monotony. Uh, there's different mental states, you know, there's being serious when there's time to be serious. There's mastering something when it's time to master something. There's a time to be rebellious. I'm not saying time to be rebellious against authority, but against rebellious against anything that would say that you can't do something, or against just the hardship of the day. And that's what we really formed as a SEAL team, is, is uh, rebellious against whatever the instructors could throw at, at us. Like as we got hard, uh, hardened and forged together as that boat crew, it didn't matter what they asked of us or what they threw of us, we were gonna find a way uh, to get there. And if we failed, and you fail all the time in buds, right, uh, then we're gonna fail effectively. Then we're gonna fail going 100%, but strategically going 100%. Uh, and so that's uh, some of the things. Uh, in life, I normally start off with high anxiety, always, and I have to develop my confidence along the way. And uh, if I can say anything, I find mentors. I tell a lot of our wounded warriors, uh, I say, listen, if, if Warren Buffett called you up and he said, for the next five years, you're going to stand right sit, you're going to be right beside me. I'm going to teach you everything about investing. At the end of those five years, even if you just took 20 to 30 percent of what he taught you, you'd probably be one of the greatest investors in the world. So it's about finding effective mentorship in your life uh, to take that next step. It's about never losing that sense of urgency and uh, always moving forward. And uh, in closing, I'm going to show you guys a home dedication of one of our guys. Uh, Jason Rosslin will open up for questions. Uh, he has had over 240 surgeries. Um, he, uh, explosive ordnance disposal tech. Uh, Mike Schlitz had his mom, you know, there for him through the whole thing. Some of these guys have their wives that stay with them. Some of their wives leave them as soon as they get injured. Uh, and Jason had his wife leave him and then his uh, mom and dad come and take care of him. And so he has his two little daughters and, uh, and we did their house in Fallbrook, uh, Fallbrook just a little bit south of here. So let's see here. I'll do it from the... Oh, here we go. Three words, independence, freedom, and the most important word, dignity, comes to mind when we build these homes. The same independence and freedom and dignity 
that you, sir, have provided for me and my family and all of us here today when you made the sacrifices that you did. Jason, you have most assuredly made a difference in all of our lives. And while most of us will never face the types of battles that you have, Watching you meet your difficult challenges inspires us all to triumph in our daily lives, no matter what harrowing experiences we may face ourselves. All of us in uniform, we stand on the shoulders of the generation before us. As the Marine Corps motto is, Semper Fidelis, that's what this family was, always faithful to each other. And that's why it is all about family. It is all about community. It is all about continued service. To make sure, as Gary says, that we're here for our fellow service members before, during, and after the battle. When we build these houses, we build it not only for the veteran that's injured, we keep in mind the family members. And for the girls, the girls have not seen their rooms yet. And uh, I'm going to throw up one more picture and end with this. This is us raising the flag. At, at, at the end of every home dedication ceremony, we raise the flag. Every, every home that we do has, a, has a, a flagpole, and we raise their unit's flag. This is the Army flag and the American flag. And that's uh, Rusty Dunnigan's. Uh, he, he's there in the wheelchair. You can't get a really good picture of him. But, and then his wife, Angie and uh, members of his unit that are actually now re that were retired but still came out for his home dedication. Um, I remember when I was in uh, Bud, sometimes we'd go on these long runs and uh, an instructor would take us and he would say, hey, today's a core value class. And that meant every mile they were gonna stop and teach us a core value. So we'd run in the soft sand behind the instructor and, and uh, then at, at a mile he would stop and he would teach us a core value. So some days I had 20 to 25 core values. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But uh, I remember one of the times he said, he's, he told us that in his time with the teams, this was 2003, said that he had been to over uh, uh, memorials or funerals for over eight individuals while his time. And I, I remember at the time thinking, wow, that's so many, you know. And over the last 10 years, I've been to memorials or funerals for over 70 of my friends. And uh, so that's why I think it's so important um, for all of us, what you know, Professor Cup talked about and everything like is, is reaching out to those veterans' families. And it, it, it can be a hard life being away from families and homes. I remember after my second tour, my dad told me, he's like, you know, your mom and I want to see your tours come to an end. You know, we're, we're getting older. And I said, okay, Pop, so that's why I only did two more. But uh, 
but it, it, you know, reaching out to the veterans, just you know, giving your appreciation and and uh, going forward. And and this is always my favorite part of the home dedication is raising the flag uh, at a military funeral. At the end, they, they fold the flag, and they give it to the family, and they say, on behalf of a grateful nation, thank you for your son's service or your daughter's service. And uh, they give it to the family. When we raise the flags here, I always say to Rusty, or I say to uh, uh, Jason Ross, I say, Jason, on behalf of a grateful nation, thank you for your service, and welcome home. And we raise that flag, and that flag breathes and waves in the air. Thank you very much today, and uh, if you guys have any questions, I'll field them now. I gave you guys exactly two minutes. <laughs> I just want to say a quick thank you to Billy and Jesse and the alumni director, and I had the privilege of meeting Billy through Rick, so thank you for bringing him today. We have a reception in the atrium with food and drinks. I know Danny's class has to leave right at 5, so some of you can stay. Billy will be at the reception for half an hour if you want to ask your questions then or now. Um, those of you that have to go, you can go, but just thank you again, Billy. And could everyone stand here who served our country? I just wanted yeah, to publicly recognize everyone and thank yeah. them. Wow. wow. Awesome. I think we could make a good SEAL platoon right there. <laughs> uh, thank you for your service. So appreciate it. Anybody have any questions? Yes. As somebody who attended schools that have strong faith uh, value system that instill in students, um, did you ever find that uh, your faith was tested during your, your time in the SEAL, like in any particular? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a pretty long question because that can be a whole other set of DVDs and videos. Like, <laughs> If I kind of show my faith and, and everything went through the times. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, uh, Andrew Petrell, he's a triple amputee. We're building him a home down in, in, uh, in, in, in San Diego, actually going to re renovate one. But he was with me on my fourth tour. And uh, we went out, and there was our LPO. I was a chief at the time, leading petty officer, which is one rank below me. He was a raging atheist, and he was also five foot six and had a huge Napoleon complex. You know? And he's a great guy. He was funny. And there was another guy named Caleb, and Caleb was a very, very strong Christian. You know? uh, the teams probably hardened me at one time because I, uh, uh, I remember we were kind of sitting in the weight room, and one guy was talking about the situation that he had with this other guy. And the SEAL teams, you know, just like I'm sure your units, you can fight anybody. You know? So I was like, well, maybe you need to just you know, go out there and do what you need to do. And I remember, <laughs> I remember Caleb said, well, that's one way to handle it. And Caleb was a big buff guy. And he, and he said, you know, and he took even a more Christian approach. And he said, uh, you know, or you can maybe handle it this way, you know. Um, and I'll never forget that. I met Caleb on September 11th. And we were on a mission early uh, in the morning. This is 2011 on October 1st. And Caleb got hit. He was killed. And uh, Andrew came back as a triple amputee. And the other... Uh, uh, long, I, I, this story is pretty long, but I'm going to shorten it up. I remember I come, came back to the Kulat. So a Kulat in Afghanistan is like we were doing village stability operations, which is a hardened, it's like hardened mud, basically. And we would take over these vill this Kulat by uh, eminent domain, basically, and then pay the guy rent. Uh, and it was good rent. He was making good money. But I remember after Caleb died, I walked around, and Caleb and, and uh, this other guy who was a raging atheist, you know, would go back and forth sometimes. And I remember I, I, I came around and, and I saw uh, a guy, uh, his name was uh, Jared, like doing something, building something. I was like, I go, what are you building? And he's like, he goes, I'm building a cross. And I go, you're building a cross? And he goes, yeah, I'm building a cross for Caleb. And, uh, and he built that cross to resemble Caleb too in a lot of ways because Caleb was such a, a strong guy. He made that thing uh, like about, it was like six uh, cubed inches or whatever, really thick all the way around. It was about seven or eight feet tall. And I was, and I was like, and he started it, you know, and, and uh, we all started helping in. And I go, well, what are we going to do with it? And he goes, I'm going to take it up to that high mountain right there. And he goes, we're going to have the EOD guys like blow a hole and then we're going to pour cement and then set it up there. And so that's what we did as a whole unit. We even um, uh, took some pictures. I was talking to Andrew today. He so sent me some pictures. I'm going to, uh, but we took it up there. We put in there and we put a low light on that cross. And then wherever we went, because it was the highest mountain in the area, 
uh, no matter if we were five clicks out, 10 clicks out, whatever, we could look back and we could see that cross with our NVGs uh, shining behind us. Um, and uh, it, it's little things like that that really, you know, buoyed my faith in, in the guys and stuff like that. Your faith is going to definitely get tested. And, uh, and you're going to go through ups and lows and times when your faith is barely, barely hanging on and times when your faith is, is really, really strong. Um, and that's where you try to, you know, surround yourself with other, other uh, strong people of faith, you know. And that was the one thing I have to say about guys in the SEAL teams. I mean, they're all walks of life. But even a guy who was a raging atheist, you know, respected, and he was the one that did that, you know, for Caleb. And he had great faith in his friend and great respect for him, you know. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, with your law degree and passing the bar, you could have gone in as Lieutenant JG uh, and gone through the JAG course. Uh, if you'd gone and you graduated from the JAG course, would have that precluded you from going into the SEALs? Well, first of all, now you tell me, right? <laughs> could have used that information a long time ago. <laughs> um, I don't know if it had or not, or if it, if it wouldn't. I actually never passed the bar. Um, I, was, I was planning uh, after my third deployment to come back and, and, and take the bar, and I actually dropped three grand, which was like half of a month's pay for me at the time, on a Kaplan course, and I studied for uh, the, the multi-state and actually did you know, decently on it, and I was like, all right, you know, uh, not, that buoyed my confidence, so the next bar that was going to come up, I was planning to pass, and, and, uh, and that's when I, I got a call from my warrant officer, and he called me in one day, and he's like, he goes, uh, he called me at 7.30 in the morning. When you're on shore duty, no one calls you at 7.30 in the morning, you know. And he said, hey, we need, uh, we need somebody. I go into his office. I go, what's up, sir? And he's like, he goes, we need somebody to go to Afghanistan. It's got to be somebody in this room. I'm looking around. I'm the only guy in the room. I'm like, I'm going to Afghanistan? He's like, well, we need an individual augmentee. They need him. Like, he's got to deploy in 50 days. And normally you have 18 months to deploy. And I go, I'm going to Afghanistan? Like, I was, because I was planning to start my law career and everything at that time. And I would talk to my buddies who'd been practicing for eight, nine years. And so he goes to the master chief who's in charge of manning and personnel. And he says, uh, the master chief hey, says, hey, did you find any volunteers? He goes, yeah, I, I called uh, WAGS in and I told him we need a volunteer to go to Afghanistan. And he said, I'm going to Afghanistan. <laughs> and I, I said to him again, are, are you sure we need a volunteer? And he said emphatically to me, I'm going to Afghanistan. I'm like, it's not the exact way that I think there's some semantics involved. But, uh, but so I really didn't know of, of all those things. And, I, and, I, uh, and after 9-11, I was so just target focused um, that I really, uh, if, if that was a way to go in, I, I didn't know about it. Any bar will do. You, don't, you just don't want to do California. OK, yeah. <laughs> I guess I could have done Montana or something like that. Right? <laughs> yeah, I didn't know. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes, sir. Jonas Kelsaw. No, I, I don't. Do you know what team he was at? Or? He was on a, this team, the helicopter that got shot down. Special section on it. And he was still like 13 or 14. Was it, on, was it in August? Was extortion 117? Yeah. Yeah. So no, I didn't know him. I had some good friends that went down that helo. Um, a guy named Jesse Pittman from SEAL Team 5. He used to always tell his wife, baby, I don't run into battle. I charge. Uh, <laughs> Another guy, Jason Workman, who a uh, great guy, he was from Utah. Me and him won the Breacher Obstacle Course together, and that was basically because uh, I was just trying to keep up with the guy. He was such a beast. Um, I was always trying to keep up with just everybody, but uh, he was another great one. There was, there was a lot of great guys that we lost that day. But no, I didn't know him. Who else? Who's the shot of the title? Come on. <laughs> 